Welcome back to the conversation, and really excited to have Johan Hari joining me. His new book is a must-read, Chasing the Scream. It's getting a lot of talk. It's selling very well. Chasing the Scream, the first and last days of the war on drugs is the title. Uh, he has been named Journalist of the Year by Amnesty International, not once but twice. Uh, he's the author of the, this new book, as I just mentioned, and we're really excited to have him, Johan Hari, joining us. Uh, before we get into the book, I think it's interesting what you did with this book in terms of trying to make up for the uh, mistakes in the past of your career, because in the, in the past you had made some mistakes and not attributing certain quotes to other journalists when you're at The Independent. Uh, you left that newspaper because you didn't want to bring any attention to them. And so because, uh, because of that, this book, uh, you have tons of notes and you've documented uh, the audio transcript so nobody can have any question about. Explain a little bit about that because people might have questions. Yeah, what I did was put up all the quotes uh, for the book on the website, chasingthescream.com. So you can follow along, you can hear the people speaking to you. So you can hear every quote being said directly to me as it goes on, which I think is kind of cool because I spoke to such a... Uh, fascinating range of people anyway that I think to hear their voices actually kind of enriches the experience of the book anyway. I think the most important part of this book is your 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 journalism in terms of how much time you spent uh, talking to people, what kind of people you, you, you spoke to, uh, and where you went. Because when we talk about um, the war on drugs, we always talk about it from one point of view, which is doesn't take into consideration all of the different points of view. So we talk about the the the, the, the demand. We talk about um, the production. We talk about uh, law enforcement. We talk about race. Uh, we don't talk about nearly as much about the drug cartels and so on. You, you basically uh, covered it all. Tell us what exactly you did, how long uh, you, you spent, and, and the types of people uh, you talked to. Because you're only going to get into just so much when sure. we get into the book. But I really want to help people understand what you did. Four years ago, when I started working on this book, I realized we were coming up to 100 years since drugs were first banned. And this was a subject I'd cared about all my life. One of my earliest memories is of trying to wake up one of my relatives and not being able to, and realizing as I got older that we had drug addiction in my family. And I thought of myself as a fairly well-informed person. But I suddenly kind of realized that there were loads of really basic questions I didn't know the answer to, that I'd never learned from our culture. And um, why did we go to war against drug users and addicts in the first place 100 years ago? Why do we continue with that approach when a lot of people think it doesn't work? Um, what are the alternatives to that approach in practice? And what really causes drug use and drug addiction? And as I kind of looked at this, looked for the answers for this, I realized that a lot of, I think part of the problem is we discuss this question as if it was like an abstract question, as if we were at a philosophy seminar, you know, and it was like how the world should be. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to sit with real people and figure out how this approach has changed people's lives and how the alternatives would change people's lives. So I just went on this big, long journey. I didn't realize it would be quite as long as it would ended up being when I started, you know, but I ended up going across 30,000 miles, nine countries, and just sitting with a really fascinating range of people from a transsexual crack dealer here in Brownsville, Brooklyn, to um, one of the only people to ever be at the heart of the deadliest Mexican drug cartels and make it out to tell his story, to a scientist who spends a lot of time feeding hallucinogens to mongooses to see what happens, to the only country that's ever decriminalized all drugs from cannabis to crack. And I think the key thing that I realized is almost everything we think we know about this subject, including me at the start, is wrong. Drugs are not what we think they are. Addiction is not what we think it is. The drug war is not what we've been told it is for 100 years. And the alternatives are not what we've been told they are either. We um, all have an opinion on this issue because we all have experience with this issue. I think that makes the issue one of the most fascinating and important issues we could discuss. Do you agree with that? And totally. based on and, and the way you've written this, and everybody you talk to, everybody that, um, I mean, every, anybody who reads it, reads it with a point of, with an experience that they are themselves an addict, uh, they've used or abused or recreationally, or someone in their family or someone they know close uh, has. And, and so everybody comes to it with a point of view, but there are some things that are just kind of factual, it seems, in terms of the history and certainly in terms of science. And that's where I kind of wanted to start, because I think the why, um, the beginning of the drug war, uh, is the most fascinating, one of the most fascinating things I've read in any book. This is high praise, because uh, we, we read a lot here for, the, for this show. And 
I think of your book, as certainly this, the, the, the first section, as one of the most enlightening pieces. And I'm trying to go back and fact check everything and look up everything that you said. But, I mean, there's not much more than we can do than you did with your research of Henry Amsinger. Amsinger? Um, tell us about this man and take as much time as you want because everybody needs to know about this guy and and his influence. And the way that you structure the book, you, you make him as one of the, the key figures that we need to know. If you had said to me four years ago, why were drugs banned? I would have guessed that, that people gave them the reasons that we would give now. You know, you don't want people to, uh, you know, people to become addicted. You don't want kids to use. What's fascinating going back and doing the historical research is that stuff barely comes up. There's a very different reason why drugs were banned, and it's very relevant to now. Harry Anslinger is probably the most influential person who no one's ever heard of. He's a government bureaucrat who takes over the Department of Prohibition just as alcohol prohibition is ending. So he's got this big, very corrupt government department with basically nothing to do. And he has to find a purpose for it. He wants to keep his bureaucracy going. So he had previously said that he didn't have any problem with marijuana. He suddenly announced that marijuana was the most evil drug in America, worse than heroin. And he really uh, launches this war. He invents the modern drug war. And he's really driven by two intense hatreds. One is an intense hatred of addicts. And the other is an intense hatred of African-Americans. I want to understand, he's a guy who was regarded as crazily racist by the crazy racists in the 1930s. He used the N-word so often in official police memos that his own senator said he should be fired. And the way I tell the story of the role that race played in the start of the drug war is through the story of Billie Holiday and how Harry Anslinger stalked and helped to kill her. In 1939, not that far from where we're sitting now, Billie Holiday stands on stage in New York City and she sings the song Strange Fruit, which a lot of your listeners will know. It's a song against lynching. Her goddaughter Lorraine Feather said to me, you've got to understand how shocking it was have an African-American woman standing up in front of a white audience in a hotel where she wasn't even allowed to walk through the front door. She had to go through the service elevator and sing a song against lynching at a time when most pop songs were like, P.S. I love you, right? That night, Harry Anslinger's men tell her, stop singing this song. She's told to stop. They know she's a heroin addict, but it takes until she starts to talk about race and stand up to white supremacy that they start to warn her. At the same time as Harry Anslinger found out Billie Holiday was a heroin addict, he found out Judy Garland, Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz, was a heroin addict. He told her to take longer vacations and assured the studio she was going to be fine. He treated Billie Holiday very differently because she effectively said, screw you, I'm going to sing my song. She'd grown up in segregated Baltimore when she wasn't allowed in a lot of stores because she was an African-American. And she promised herself she was never going to bow her head to any white man. So when these people came, she said, you know, I'm going to sing my song about lynching. And she did. The first person Harry Anslinger sends after her, he, he hated employing African-Americans. Uh, but you couldn't really send a white guy into Harlem to stalk Billie Holiday. It'd be kind of conspicuous. So he employs this African-American agent called Jimmy Fletcher. And Jimmy Fletcher is sent to follow her for two years and record her drug taking, which she was doing to stun her grief. She'd been raped as a child. She'd been prostituted as a child. And Billie Holiday was so amazing, Jimmy Fletcher fell in love with her. And his whole life, he felt ashamed of what he did. He busts her. She's put on trial. She said the trial was called the United States versus Billie Holiday. And that's how it felt. She's sent to prison. But the cruelest thing is what happens next. She gets out of prison and she's not allowed to perform. You needed a license, a cabaret performer's license to perform anywhere where alcohol was served. They wouldn't give it to her. Anslinger had it denied to her. So her friend Yolanda Bavan said to me, what is the cruelest thing you can do to a person? It's to take away the thing they love. Take away singing from Billie Holiday. It was just unbelievably cruel. She always tried to find somewhere to perform, but it was difficult. Of course, in that situation, she relapses. She goes back into heroin. When she's in her early 40s, again near here, she collapses. She's taken to hospital. The first hospital won't even take her in because she's an addict. The second hospital takes her in. And she says to one of her friends, she's convinced that the, the narcotics agents and Anslinger's men aren't finished with her. She says to one of her friends, they're going to kill me in there. Don't let them. They're going to kill me. She's diagnosed with liver cancer. On her deathbed, they handcuff her to the deathbed. I interviewed the last remaining person to be in that room. They, um, they don't let her friends in to see her. They take away her candies and her comic books and her record player. One of her friends, Maylee, manages to insist that she's given methadone because she's gone into heroin withdrawal, which is very dangerous if you're very weak with cancer. Right. They, um, they give her methadone. She starts to recover. A little bit later, they cut off methadone and she dies. One of her friends said she looked like she had been violently wrenched from life. But to me, the amazing thing about that story about Billie Holiday, the thing that really helped me to think about the addicts in my life it's the heroism of it. You know, no matter what they did to her, Billie Holiday never gave up on that song. She always found somewhere they'd have her. She went to the South. She went anywhere she could go. And she sang Strange Fruit. 
Her friend Annie Ross said to me that we shouldn't think about Billie Holiday as weak. She said, Billie Holiday was as strong as she could be. And to know that addicts can be hero, anyone who's got addicts in their life will be angry with them sometimes. Totally understandably, I am. But to know that addicts can be heroes, I think is very uh, helpful. And also, I think it really tells us a lot about the dynamics of the drug war. Firstly, it tells us how much it was about race at the beginning, not about addiction. And that runs right through to the present day. African-Americans are no more likely to be drug users or drug dealers than anyone else. And they are the vast majority of people. Well, I mean, a lot of a lot of people have a hard time uh, believing the claims that you're making, that I'm making, that race played such an, uh, a pivotal and primary role in the drug war at the, at the beginning and still now. I mean, you reference Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow. Mm-hmm. That's one of the other books that I talk so much about. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, uh, the other thing that you mentioned about Henry Anslinger, which is extremely important, is that he was a paranoid conspiracy theorist th- who saw apparently, you know, a conspiracy around every corner and, 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 and behaved in, in, a, in, a, in a wild way, even from the beginning. You, you document that. Uh, very well, and he said all ki- made up all kinds of things about drugs. Just made them up, and and when when people questioned him, uh, he had them uh, silenced one way or another. At the end of his career, apparently, uh, he does this interview with Playboy magazine uh, with a bunch of other experts, doctors, where all of the things he said were challenged, and he couldn't do anything about it. And and that's a fascinating part of your book where that's documented because. We, hear, we see this now from politicians. Politicians just say things that aren't true, but people then begin to believe them. This guy was an extremely powerful guy. He was a conspiracy theorist, and he went unchallenged for the most part. But explain more about the origins um, uh, uh, of uh, the drug war in terms of race, because you do you go in depth on marijuana and opiates with Chinese. I mean, explain a little bit about that as well. Well, actually, it's funny what you say about conspiracy theories. The great tragedy of Harry Anslinger is he didn't see the one conspiracy that was right in front of him. It's fascinating. There was a deliberately written loophole in the drug laws when they were banned a century ago, where they said, um, none of this applies to addicts. You can, doctors can give the drugs to addicts, right? It was very deliberately designed. The ban was not meant to apply to them. And this was shut down by Anslinger state by state. And one of the last places to hold out was California, where doctors prescribed heroin. It was hugely popular. The mayor of Los Angeles stands in front of a heroin prescribing clinic and says, you know, you won't shut this down because... People, it does a good job for the people of LA. And the reason why it was shut down is something I uncovered for the book, which as far as I know hasn't been known about since the time. The local Chinese drug gangs were really pissed off. that In Nevada, if you were a heroin addict, you had to go to the Chinese drug gangs to buy your heroin. But in California, you could go to the doctor. So the, narco- so the, the, the Chinese drug gangs bribed the Californian uh, narcotics agents to introduce the drug war, to launch a crackdown, because it transferred control of the drug trade to them. It tells you so much about who wins from the war on drugs every time. The biggest winners, the only winners from this century-long war have been armed criminal gangs. We've transferred one of the biggest industries in the world to them. And, you know, to see that at the beginning was so interesting. I think you're also right about, you know, how Anslinger... It's very interesting the thing you said about marijuana. Anslinger latches on... as As I said before, Anslinger had said that marijuana was not harmful and didn't do any harm. And then when he needs to buff up his department, suddenly he decides it's evil. And he latches onto the case of a boy called Victor Lacata, who was a boy in his early 20s in Florida who hacked his family to death with an axe. And um, at the kind of Fox News of its day, Hearst newspapers, latches onto this story with Anslinger's encouragement. And they say, look, this is what will happen if you smoke marijuana. You'll hack your family to death with an axe. It becomes one of the biggest news stories in America. Years later, someone goes back and checks the psychiatric records of this boy. There's not even any evidence he used marijuana. He was, of course, he had congenital insanity in his family. His family had been told to institutionalize him before. There's so many myths and misconceptions that are born in the birth of the drug war that we uh, now take for granted. You know, you st- of course, we've now moved beyond the idea that marijuana invariably causes madness. But for example, what we think about addiction and ha- what causes addiction, a lot of that originates at this time. And one of the things that most blew my mind doing the research for the book is that Addiction is not what we think it is. Addiction actually has quite different causes to the ones that we we think. Well, when you talk about that, that's where I that, that's where I haven't been able to do my my due diligence and my research because the, the 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 where you document all that stuff, it's fascinating, fascinating, and I and I hope that 
uh, the research that you document and the doctors and experts that you talk to are right about that. I'm still not co- totally convinced on on some of that research that you've done, but 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 by all means, uh, I- explain that because I I. Yeah. It's a very, I mean, the the the, the rat experiment um, is a very interesting experiment. But what what I've learned from talking so much health policy, Johan here is, is that you know sometimes we hear uh, one research project, one peer reviewed study, and then we hear a lot of anecdotes which are very convincing, but aren't necessarily the bulk uh, uh, of the research, and do have a lot of uh, of critical thinking. And I, and I'm wondering how much of the criticism of the scientists and doctors you looked at um, that, that, that you referenced, did you do? How, how much did oh, you look at amount. the criticism of, sure. of, of hu- these guys? A huge amount. And uh, I, exactly like you say, it took me quite a long time to absorb this, sure. this alternative theory. And it seemed to me to be instinctively wrong because like you and like everyone listening to this, you know, I've been immersed in a, you know, a system of, of, of propaganda. If you had said to me four years ago, what causes heroin addiction? I would have looked at you like you were a little bit simple-minded and I would have said heroin causes heroin addiction. We've been told this story for a century, which is not untrue, but is only a very small part of the truth. And that's important to understand. It's not that we've been told something false. The um, first thing that led to me to the fact that there may be something wrong with the story we've been told. You know, we think you, me and the next 20 people who walk past the studio, if we all use heroin together for 20 days, because there are chemical hooks in the heroin, our body will start to physically need the heroin. And on day 21, we will have a physical craving. And that is what addiction means. Right. Right. First thing that led to me to the fact that there may be something wrong with that is when it was explained to me by a doctor in Vancouver. You and me step out of this studio onto whatever it is, 7th Avenue, today, and we're hit by a car, and we break our hip. We'll be taken to hospital. Very likely, we'll be given a lot of diamorphine. Diamorphine is heroin. It's much better heroin than you'll ever score on the streets because it's medically pure as opposed to the stuff dealers sell, which is very cut. You'll be given that heroin for quite a long period of time. Anyone listening to this anywhere in America, there are people in hospital near you being given lots of heroin for quite long periods of time. If what we think about addiction is right, those people should leave hospital, some of them at least, as addicts, right? They should, you will have noticed your grandmother was not turned into a, a junkie by her hip replacement operation. There's some, that almost never happens, right? So that, when I learned that, I thought, oh, I didn't really know what to do with that. It seems so weird. Till I met a guy called Bruce Alexander, who's a professor. But hold, on, but hold on before you get, but I think that happens all the time. Just anecdotally, I, again, I haven't done the research in terms of people um uh, that have especially sports injuries getting on painkillers and then staying on the not not yeah. i mean how many guys do i know that had a back problem that took percocets took percocets and they couldn't get off it doesn't mean all of them does doesn't mean the majority of them does but it does I, the the problem is that we focus on the times that it does and not that at times that it doesn't i think that that's part of the problem but you've also got to ask what's different about the people who do get addicted compared to the people who don't and to understand that you have to look at this guy there's several things you have to look at, but one of them is this guy, Bruce Alexander, who's a professor, very distinguished professor in Vancouver. He explained to me, the idea of addiction we have, that it's the chemical that causes the addiction primarily, comes from a series of experiments that were done earlier in the 20th century. They're really simple experiments. Your listeners can do them at home if they're feeling a little bit sadistic. You get a rat and you put it in a cage and you give it two water bottles. One is just water and one is water laced with either heroin or cocaine. If you do that, the rat will almost always prefer the drugged water and almost always kill itself quite quickly. So there you go, that's our theory of addiction. In the 70s, Bruce Alexander comes along and says, hang on a minute, we're putting the rat in an empty cage, got nothing to do except use the drugs, let's try this differently. So Bruce builds Rat Park. Rat Park is like heaven for rats. Everything a rat could want, it's got in Rat Park. It's got cheese, it's got coloured balls, it's got tunnels, it's got friends that can have loads of sex, and it's got both the water bottles, the... um, the drugged water and the normal water. But here's the fascinating thing. In Rat Park, they don't like the drugged water. They almost never use it. Uh, They never use it in a way that looks compulsive. They never overdose. Now, there's a human example of that that's really important that I can tell you about in a minute. But what Bruce says is this shows us that both the the left-wing theory and the right-wing theory of addiction are largely wrong. The right-wing theory is it's a kind of moral failing. You know, you're a hedonist, you indulge yourself. The left-wing theory is your brain gets hijacked, you get taken over. Bruce says... It's not your morality, it's not your brain, it's your cage. Addiction is largely an adaptation to your environment. Human beings need to bond, we need to connect. When we're happy and healthy, we will connect and bond with each other. If you can't connect with other people because you're beaten down or traumatised or isolated or you were never taught how to, 
you will connect with something that gives you some sense of relief. But how does that uh, disprove um, that the the way that treatment facilities work? Because it disproves that we shouldn't. It, it, it proves that we shouldn't punish people. That we shouldn't shame people. And and you're talking about a different way to treat them and connecting them and 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 hel- having them not feel isolated. But that is. I mean, what is wrong with our current day treatment facilities for you know drug re- drug rehabilitation? They have very poor success rates. Around 25% of people who go to rehab manage to, uh, you know, stay off drugs. Very poor success rates. And partly because they're based on the wrong theory of addiction. Lots of rehab centers are run by really good people. There are ones I admire. But largely, they're based on the idea you need to physically separate the person from the drug. And then you send them back into the world where they're used. Mm. What's been really effective, we have to look at, again, I want to stress that we should never talk about these things in abstract ways. We need to talk about real places. There have been lots of experiments in yeah. different places. The place that to me is most exciting is Portugal. Right. Portugal has had an extraordinary success in reducing drug addiction and drug use. Sorry, drug addiction. And the, um, the way they did it is really important. And it's not the, re- largely not the rehab model that we have in North America and, and Britain. In Portugal, in the year 2000, they had one of the worst drug problems in Europe. Yeah. 1% of the population was addicted to Which heroin. Which is a crazy number of people. Crazy. It's, we're, we're, you pass 100 people in the street, one of them's going to be a heroin addict. Right. It's mad. And every year they tried the American way more and more. They arrested more people, imprisoned more people, and every year the problem got worse. So one day the prime minister and the leader of the opposition got together and said, look, we can't, basically, we can't carry on like this. They decided to set up a panel of scientists and doctors to figure out what would genuinely solve the problem. And they agreed in advance that whatever the panel recommended, they would do. Just took it out of politics. So the panel goes away for a year and a half, looks at all the best evidence from all over the world, came back and said, decriminalize everything, from cannabis to crack. But And this is the crucial second stage. It's about learning the lesson of Rat Park. Take all the money we currently spend on punishing and cutting off addicts and use it instead to help addicts to reconnect with the society. Now, partly that's rehab and psychological support, but mostly it was something much more basic. Subsidised jobs, subsidised housing for addicts. Say you and me used to be, say you and me were heroin addicts in Portugal. We used to be mechanics. They will go to a garage and when we're ready, they'll say, if you employ this guy for a year, uh, we will pay half his wages. Just the idea, If you think about it right, the best way I'd explain it is, I'm drinking a bottle of Diet Coke here. I can't see if you've got any water. I've from the- got yeah. tea this morning. Yeah. We could I knew be- you were coming. We could be drinking vodka, right? Perfectly legally. Forget the drug laws. Mm. These could be- it's not vodka because we've got things we want to be present in the world for. We've got jobs we love. We've got people we want to talk to. We've got things to do. The goal of the Portuguese decriminalization was to make sure that every addict in Portugal woke up with something meaningful to do that morning. Well, the, the 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 answer that I mean I I am so fascinated by what's happened in in Portugal. I only got about two minutes here left, but I mean I cannot see the American uh, political, the American uh, Congress the way it is now, uh, seeing that as anything more but an unbelievable expansion of the welfare state. Now you get because you you already described how mo- many of us look at addicts, and that's not only a, a conservative thing. Plenty of liberals look at them and and, and look down upon them and shame them and and, and so on. Uh, but the idea that we're going to do that in America, and you talked yeah. to the guy who was the biggest critic in, in Portugal of this uh, experiment, and he has reversed himself completely on it. Uh, we don't do that in America. Well, I'd say two things. Firstly, injecting drug use is down by 50% in Portugal since they did this. That model has been proven to it work. Doesn't matter. Chris- it doesn't matter what we're – here's why yeah. all of this is bullshit to me, because it doesn't matter what works for the rest of the world. I mean, look at our health care argument, Johan. Our, our argument about health policy in America has been profoundly ridiculous because uh, – and as you know, you understand it being British. I mean, Canadians look at it and laugh at us. I mean, we do a lot of things here that uh, – and we look at the rest of the world. It's working over there, and we try to point at that, and they Say no. If, America if we, is different. I, I, totally un, I totally understand what you're saying. If we had been sitting here in 1969 when a bunch of drag queens started a riot outside the Stonewall Inn, and the pro-gay position was to say that drug people, that gay people were sick, not evil. That was the pro-gay position, right? right? We'd had 2,000 years of the persecution of gay people. If you had said less than 50 years from now there will be gay marriage in the United States, and the biggest cheer in the black president's second inauguration address will be for gay marriage. It would have seemed like the most ludicrous science fiction. Or think about if we'd been sitting here in 1925 in this exact – whatever was in this building in 1925, and we had said there would be a system of social security and Medicare, it would have seemed insane. If you'd explained that all old people will get their health care costs paid, if you explained that you know poor people will get support, it would have seemed ludicrous. Things – despair is a self-fulfilling prophecy. 
things we live in a vastly more civilized both of us live in vastly more civilized countries than they were 50 years ago they will carry on being more civilized if enough people organize and fight well, for it there are huge forces ranged against us we face a massive challenge i agree with you on that but if we say it'll never happen it'll never happen well if we organize and demand it we have a very I, good chance i i apologize for using an absolute and i respect your <laughs> i respect your uh, your hope and your aspiration for it and uh, and maybe i can say it'll happen it'll take a long time but i think that your book chasing the scream will go a long way uh, to educating a, a, a lot more of us on on the history of the drug war and and hopefully the future end to it. The bottom line is we've tried everything we can in America to get people to stop using drugs and to punish them for using it. There's there isn't anything we haven't tried. We've tried it all. Yeah, I, it's failed miserably. We've seen other countries try other things. Now we've seen Colorado and Washington State uh, succeed with marijuana legalization, which puts us in the forefront of this issue. Actually, um, more people need to read this book. Uh, a lot of people already are. It's called a Chasing. The Scream, The First and Last Days of the of the War on Drugs. Johan Hari, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, call in in the future because there's so much. We barely even got to it. I'm Anytime. Part one in the book. All right. Uh, when we come back, we'll talk about it.